uh, tell us about uh, global scale business. Yes. Thank you for having me. This is my first uh, visit to the Software Circus, so that's a good introduction for me to this event. Um, I started with a gen only three months ago, and I was asked to tell a story about Postgres. So it's not really my story, and that's why I want to start this with, this was basically the PGConf 2016 opening keynote. Um, but what I'm trying to convey to you that uh, Postgres is very good for you, because there was something in the title of the meetup, uh, something like uh, new and shiny and old and trusted. Well, you know what? The most shiny boots are that I have at home. They are my very old and trusted snow boots, because they have this leather, and the more they age, the more they start to shine. So I'd say it's not the new and shiny versus the old and trusted, but the new and shiny versus the old and shiny. But so far for the introduction, um, Clicker doesn't work. Um, let me introduce you to Ajen. Uh, you working in Amsterdam, I expect some of you will know the name. Give me a raise of hands for those who know the name. Well, that's more than half of you. I'll give you a bit of an introduction. We've had the first talk when it was talking about a ledger. Basically, what Ajen does is being a very big ledger. We, we take care of moving funds from one party to another and to do so, we, we do a lot of stuff in a lot of uh, offices and a lot of continents. We do that with a lot of employees. And these numbers did have an update since the last time. We've now passed the 100 billion processed volume in a year. So uh, um, we are growing year on year, and we have a lot of companies that give part of their payment volume to us. For example, we had Singles Day. 11.11, we uh, processed some volume of Ali, uh, um, the Chinese guys, uh, to get more and more stuff going. And what do we do as a gen? Where do we actually provide value? Well, we provide value by removing a lot of steps in this payment ecosystem. I'm new to, to this payment ecosystem, but there's a lot of players involved. There's Visa, MasterCard, there's banks, the bank of the merchant selling you the goods, and your bank issuing you the card. And then in between, there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be done. And that's where all these payment processes are working, and some risk management. Zip code 1234 AA here in Amsterdam seems to be a very bad zip code because it's used by everyone. So that's bad risk management if you actually uh, consider that bad. What Agen tries to do is be more of combine these functions and offer that as a service to a merchant. So we're not really customer facing, not as a consumer, but more for, for businesses. And then yeah, if you do online businesses, it's, it's probably easier, but we also do physical point of sales. So what Agen is, um, the name Agen, there is some discussion. I've been told it's a word in Surinams, meaning to do it again. But then someone from Suriname said, well, that's not true. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but at least that's a story that's been told. Agen is uh, uh, created by a few guys who are very experienced in the payment industry. They worked at old school banks. They worked at Bibit. That's a name that is, I've already heard tonight. So um, they've learned a lot of lessons from that. And one of the things with old school banks is they are slow, traditional, they have some well, ways around them. And what Agen, what the focus was is trying to build something new instead of using all these old systems. And how did Agen do that? Um, well, by just designing a new architecture. Don't look at the old mainframes with that stuff, but try it from the start create a scalable architecture. Um, and base it fully on open source technology that allows you to be free from any licensing costs, but it also allows you, which is very much related, to scale without having to think about licensing costs. 
So uh, licensing costs in themselves are not bad, but if you have an open source technology, you can scale easier than that. And we have active active hosting, meaning that we can accept payments on most continents um, in a local data center. And that is good for low latency, because if you need to do a payment in Australia, and you need to do that in, you need to validate that in Europe, that's actually a round trip of around 300 milliseconds, <coughs> because it takes a considerable amount of uh, kilometers to get there. And uh, we keep a ledger with double entry bookkeeping, so every transaction you do will at least be two lines somewhere in a journal, one for the positive one and one for the negative one. And why did Agen choose Postgres? So we're talking about the late knots of this century that Agen was born. And they chose Postgres because it is open source and because it is yeah, just very reliable. It basically remembers everything. <laughs> I mean, regardless of the database you choose, whether it is small enough, or I don't remember the name of your database, but ClickHouse, um, or other databases, um, the point is you want to have something that persists. And you might have some acceptance of losing some data or not. But when it comes to financial data, and you're an institution shipping money, and then it really becomes paramount that you remember everything. So that is the main reason to choose Postgres. Um, the other reason to choose Postgres is more um, to choose a limited technology stack. So if you are a startup, you can choose all kinds of technologies. You can, you can use old and boring Java. Well, the good thing about old and boring Java is that you won't be running into all the tiny bugs that are there when it's shiny and new. Um, so you know you can build on that. And you have experienced people you can find. You, you, can, you can trust on that part. So if you want to innovate on another part in your architecture, just pick Java and, and do your innovation on another level. And the same goes for the database. You can choose a very new one. And I'm happy with a lot of development when it comes to Fauna, but for me it, it really feels new. If, if, um, it doesn't mean it's bad, but it does mean it might need some more uh, time in the open to get some more uh, user experience. And at the end of the knots of this century, Postgres was already very established. It has a very long track record. I think its roots are older than I am. And I'm not the youngest here anymore, so uh, uh, we're talking about a product that has a lot of uh, stuff going for it. If we look at Postgres, it is actually capable of storing quite a lot of data. But one of the challenges we have at Argen is we have this growth graph. And this growth graph is pretty simple, it's exponential. Um, it basically means that any solution that comes to, well, you can um, reduce the size of your database by just removing the old stuff. Well, the old stuff of more than a year ago is only half of the database. And as we double in size every year, we actually add a full database every year. So a strategy of let's just remove some old stuff doesn't really address the issue of growth because we are continuously growing. And um, the problem with this graph is if I would attach this year to it, it would just be steeper. So this graph is continuing to go this way. It's it, Probably at some point it will flatten out a little. I don't hope so. <laughs> because this is business. This is money. Um, it will collapse. Well, at, at some point it will, but I hope that's not because of the technology, but because of uh, uh, market saturation. So let me let me let me say yes. I hope it flattens out at the point of market saturation, and not at the point of Postgres breakage. Uh, uh, that's a good challenge because that's exactly the challenge we face at Agen to make sure we can carry this growth in Postgres. Yeah, so if you look at the volume we have, that's pretty much half of every year repeats. 
Um, for this year, I don't think we will have double digits growth. Well, that at some point needs to slow, uh, probably market saturation. We have uh, 100 billion now, we're aiming for a lot more. So, and that is a huge market. Um, so we have this paper from every year. The amount of transactions we process on the database um, is considerable in the sense that currently we, on average, take more than 10,000 writes per second. And that's basically on a single Postgres instance. And for that I hope to just give you some other part of the story that scaling your uh, company does not necessarily mean having to scale horizontally because you might actually be able to already scale on a Postgres system and Postgres is very sturdy. There's people building great stuff on top of it that does actually allow you to do some parallel uh, processing. Um, so Postgres as a technology is very useful and it has SQL already built in so you don't need to reinvent <laughs> that. Um, so there's a lot of things going for. So um, if you need a data store and you want to launch your product fast and you're not the next Google or the next Facebook or the next casino or the next web click mining startup, probably you don't need a huge scaling database. Because if you look at what we can do with just a single Postgres database running a hundred billion dollar business, you, that is an evidence in itself. And it's not the only one. Previously I worked at Zalando, also a multi-billion dollar business, also mainly on Postgres. So, as a testament to Postgres, here I stand. <laughs> Just as an interesting thing, you can see this is a graph of the amount of transactions. You can see it going up and down. This is of a period that's, that was still one continent very active, so you can really see the day-night uh, uh, day cycle, as far as I can, or even the weekly cycle. Uh, but here something happened, there were a lot of rollbacks happening, but probably that was only on select statements and the driver was fixed to actually switch to committing those connections. <coughs> well, uh, no money was lost in that event. The database size, well, this is, this is a graph of last year. The, the, the keynote was last year. So it says 35 terabytes, but if I now log in, it says roughly 75 terabytes. So our database is around 75 terabytes in size. That brings challenges, though, in Postgres. It, it, yeah, it's big, so anything you do will take time. Yes, question. Is it one database? Yes. One we have three of those now. Is so it one number machine? two and three are a bit smaller, but... Hmm? It's, one, it's one physical. It is, it is one physical database. We do have replication, so we have good fade-over scenarios, so it's not that this is a single node system and if that goes down, my gen goes down, no. <laughs> uh, uh, we have physical replication, multiple of those, uh, so we can we can work with that. We also have some point in time recovery options. Hopefully, we'll never need to get there, but we test them sometimes to make sure that if we get into that situation, we will uh, be standing here with a perhaps a tear in our eye, but still in business. <coughs> so this graph has actually continued uh, to about here, and that's what I mean. This this um, this pattern keeps continuing year on year. Yes. We keep all the data because, like I said with the previous graph, removing all data addresses only half of your data now. But if you double every year, then in three to four years you are ten times the size. And then removing that half that you have now is is not really interesting. Um, still, half of seventy-five giga uh, terabytes is, is a lot. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> it is, but for now we can we can cope with it. Um, and then probably the whopper. So last year I was working at OGM, but I did look at this presentation. I was in the room when this happened, and then basically we had a silent room. That is a non-partitioned table. 
uh, with indexes, I must say. The heap is 10 terabytes, so the, the data is 10 terabytes. Um, and that growth has actually slowed down as, as of last year, but as of this year, because we've now chosen to do multiple databases, because yeah, scaling this single database is getting interesting, and for some people, worrying. Um, this shows you what you can do. Um, I must say that having these volumes, like 70 terabytes, um, you do need a bit of a good storage layer below that. Uh, so you, you it's still commodity hardware, you can buy it over, over the counter somewhere, but um, um, you need to think about that I.O. layer, because the amount of transactions we process means that Postgres needs to do an empty wraparound vacuum every four to five days, which means it needs to read the whole database at least once every four to five days. Reading 75 terabytes of data is going to take time, whatever layers you put in there. So you need some beefy in-between stuff there. Talking about big tables, we had, at the beginning of this uh, evening, we had a very good story about blockchain and a linked list. If you have a table in Postgres that is segmented into segments of one gigabyte, so what is a 10 terabyte table? It's a table with 10,000 segments. And um, Ajem was bitten at some point by an implementation that Postgres had. If you need to find a page on disk and say it's in segment 800, you go to a linked list to go to the 800th segment and find that page. It being a linked list, that is becoming an interesting part of your CPU utilization of some period. So, no linked lists anymore. <laughs> the implementation has changed from a linked list to an array, reducing its, its time complexity uh, uh, very much, and space complexity is pretty much the same. So, um, um, those are interesting details that I've only learned in the last few months, uh, and that you only will find at these levels of scale. Okay, that was the big single data. But for actual scalability, um, the single database is here at the bottom. And if it goes down for 15 minutes, we don't really have an issue. If, if it goes down for a few hours, we won't have an issue. It will take a bit of time to get it uh, uh, up to uh, now again. Because the way the whole architecture is done is we have a lot of tiny front ends with tiny caches, Postgres databases. They are very useful for all kinds of situations. So you can store your stuff in a Postgres database. That means, say this is Australia, you do your payment, gets into a database, gets replicated, so we know it is persistent. And then at some point, preferably within a minute or so, it ends up in the main accounting database. So there is a lot of asynchronicity here. Uh, it doesn't mean we can reboot this database at will. It does mean that uh, if this database does need some maintenance, we will not be impacting our main money-making business, which is accepting payments. During this year, we've introduced uh, a streaming platform, which basically means we now have multiple databases with the same schema. So it looks a bit like partitioning uh, that other databases do as well. And we build streams for all these processing systems. Well, what do you use to store streams? Postgres. So, <laughs> what else? Yeah. <laughs> so we have a streaming system built on Postgres that actually does use partitioning, old school uh, Postgres partitioning, which is uh, um, which works nicely for that. It's append only, and Postgres is also very nice if you do append only because it needs to do a lot less vacuuming and maintenance and, and removing dead tuples. So append only is a good mechanism regardless of using a old school relational database or some other system. Well and we can we can we can continue with another cluster. Um, but we don't intend this to be a massive pool of clusters. We envision that the market share will not allow us to grow a hundred or two hundred times, so we don't need to prepare for that. And technological improvements in Postgres mainly 
but also in hardware, that will allow us to get some of our uh, improvements out of the hardware and software instead of moving into multiple partitions. So there are some challenges with Postgres, which is um, it being a single table makes any maintenance of an index or vacuum or whatever take a long time. We talk about days or something like that. Um, funnily enough, the main queries are very fast. B3 indexes meaning that, well, it's not that much more expensive to, to get to uh, an item and having a linked list of items solved into an array. The main queries are not that much impacted, but I think that the, the physical limit in Postgres for a table, a heap, is 32 terabytes. But we have been advised that we probably do not even want to go to near that uh, size. Don't be the first one to go there, so uh, basically. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then we are the new and shiny. Um, and another one which would really be great is multi-master replication. Um, many databases have that as an option. Um, and Postgres basically nowadays you can, you can use some third party uh, 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 stuff on, on top of Postgres, but Postgres also nowadays is logical replication, which in a sense you could use to do multi-master replication. But it's not as simple as, for example, a MongoDB or that kind of stuff uh, when it comes to setting up multi-master replication. But it is a challenge. Um, planner bugs. Well, in Postgres, planner bugs don't really exist. So we don't know what else we should call them. But you do get to the point that our data model is very relational. So seeing 18 or 19 table joins is not uncommon. And that is hell for a planner to find a good path in those, uh, in that amount of tables, to find the good path. Um, the last PGConf in, in a few weeks ago there was a great talk about how that is done. It's called the Salinger algorithm. Uh, um, but if you need to join 19 tables, in principle, you have 19 factorial options of doing so. And that is going to take a long time to just iterate through. Uh, and that's where probably planner bugs is not the right name, but yeah, just Limitation. universal constraints that there is not that Sorry. amount of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so workaround for planner bugs, which for example, the common table expression, which is I think nowadays in MySQL 8 as well, um, they can help you to do some, some fencing of, of queries. And shortage of DBAs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think DBAs nowadays is the good term anymore. Um, um, administration really sounds like you're <coughs> executing the command that was given to you in a ticket, and if it fails, you say, not, does not work, and you return the ticket. That, that role, I think, is, <coughs> has changed, if it ever existed. Uh, I'm painting a character here. here. Um, but this one is actually. Yeah, quite true. I joined a gen three months ago. We're looking for people. Um, I don't want this to be a pitch for that, but we are trying to find people. Um, and, well, if you're currently an Oracle DBA and you consider what your next step in a career would be... <laughs> we have one coming. Dave is coming here regularly, but he's at the wine tasting. <laughs> See, that's what Oracle right. DBAs do, they go to wine tasting yeah. <laughs> instead of a meeting. Yeah. 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 Thanks yeah. for the point. Um, <laughs> but all in all, uh, uh, Postgres is a very happy experience. Um, it's, uh, 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 when it comes to the community, if you have a bug that is very pressing, you'll probably have a fix quite quickly. Uh, uh, we do have support companies for that as well. Um, but even outside of my role at Agen, if I would address a problem in Postgres and I describe it nicely and at least have the decency to, to give some correct error message, chances are that within a few hours there will either be a good discussion or a fix. So um, I worked as an Oracle DBA. Well, that is nothing like the experience with Oracle. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and then I'm, I'm sorry that and he left. Um, but basically, I was—I don't want to take a jab at 
follow the beat, but he was describing servers. And I was thinking that's basically stored procedures in the database. Because they allow you to write limited functionality with its own security grants. And you can do that without a middle uh, server because it's close to the data. So it has a lot of these attributes that are also ascribed to servers. It's not a totally good comparison, but it's basically we've had that for three decades and we just are calling it differently now. Next thing, Postgres 9.2 is now out of support. This is already quite old. At the time, it looked like a good idea to create this poster. This is of the 9.4 press kit, so this is actually official Postgres material. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I remember this coming out and, and using this uh, uh, somewhere else as well. But since Postgres 9.2, we have the JSON format. Postgres 9.2 is now out of support, so we've had JSON is everywhere. If you run Postgres and you care about support, you're running something that, that can do JSON. Um, and if you're running since 9.4, I think, you can do JSON or is it 9.3? 9.3? Well, um, and JSON in Postgres allows you to address those use cases that you say, I don't want to do schema changes, they are hard. Well, you can use some schemaless stuff and stick it in a JSON and stick it in Postgres. And that actually works quite well. Um, I can attest to that for a single anecdote um, um, at Zalando we had an event system using Postgres and at some point we thought we need to scale this so we put it in Mongo which was not the best idea I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Mongo thing it worked nicely but then it became slower and slower so what we did is those applications using Mongo it was only a small set of queries that they ran against Mongo so what we did, we wrote a wrapper, or a driver, that acted to be like Mongo, but just <laughs> we stick it in Postgres. And that solved a lot of our performance problems. <laughs> that is my only experience with Mongo, but it might be a telling experience with Mongo. And, well, our first speaker was going out on roller skates, that's why my, uh, yeah, it's, it's a shame he's not here anymore. Um, Next time we'll lock the doors. Yeah, because I'm getting to the end of my talk, so you should all prepare for uh, putting on your roller skates and uh, go with the first speaker. Um, but this is this is a story of how a gen uses Postgres to scale to a pretty high level. And um, I don't want to take any wind about out of the sails of all the great new databases, but if your main purpose is not creating databases but creating nice value for your company. It might be very valuable just to stick with plain old Postgres. Thank you. Oh, questions? Yes. Uh, does this work or is this used particularly for, say, transactional workloads and keeping track of the transactional led ledger? Or do you also run your analytical workloads on top of the Postgres database? Or do you have a separate data warehouse solution? We, uh, we do run our main OLTP stuff on this one. We do have an aggregate layer, which is stored in yeah, I can't get so Postgres. <laughs> so, uh, um, because, yeah, those analytical queries, they value, well, they can get a lot of value out of some pre-aggregated stuff. Because you can imagine that financial transactions they're very hot, and if they're only a few days old, they get settled, they get done, done and then at some point they, they're cold. So if you can pre-aggregate that, or in other ways, that's useful not only in the speed of your query, but also in our new data stuff, GDPR stuff, that you should not be able to re um, identify stuff in your database to a single person. So then pre-aggregating also helps in addressing some of those security concerns uh, that you may have. Another question here. It's a very good talk. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, because comparing to these uh, new and shiny things, the, oh, <laughs> it seems to me uh, that often the value they, they offer, or at least they teach, is that uh, they offer easy uh, decentralization. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, well, that's something that uh, SQL databases, well, it's at least difficult. 
and from this diagram you showed, it seems to me that basically you, you also did the, the centralization, um, only you did it in a custom way. So, like fr from you know application developer point of view, I'm wondering if uh, if I would do it with Postgre because it seems like you have to write a lot of custom infrastructure and code to do it. So if I can summarize the question, because I don't know if everyone heard it, but he says the selling point of the, the, the new and shiny is that you can easily have multiple databases. And with Postgres, the way we did it, it seems like quite cumbersome. And as a developer, that seems hard. I'm really of the opinion, and I might be a bit harsh here, but deciding as a developer that your 10 minutes save in the initial phase of your project is worth pain and suffering for the next decade is probably something you need to consider in weighing your options. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, for sure. I'm, I'm biased. Uh, um, but, on the other hand, if you use a cloud-based solution, you can spin up RDS 1 very quickly, wrap it in something, and if it's AWS and you do some scripting around cloud formation, you can spin up 10. So what's the effort in, in doing that? Or pick a tool like Citus that allows you to do a cloud-based multi uh, uh, massive parallel stuff and use it there. So there are solutions there. Um, one thing, if you are developing on a distributed set of stuff, it's very useful to do it on a single database because that actually allows you to develop as if you are alone because that's the whole good property of this asset compliant database. Whereas you actually are very much uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, yeah, you are uh, having a lot of processes running on the database, but the whole database solves that problem for you of not having to think about the fact that there are many concurrent mm -hmm. operations happening. But isn't it because in, in your particular use case, it's because you can um, you can shard your data with these different front ends, and they don't actually need to you don't need to run transactions across them. So this big database that you had is really kind of like an archive, it's, it's just, uh, maybe I don't understand, but... Yeah, the, the, the useful yeah. thing about the architecture is that indeed these tiny databases at the front, they don't need to know of each other, because in the business layer we know they don't yeah. touch their own transaction, or they don't conflict with each other. It's also very useful that all of this is basically append only, so you never have updates, uh, so you never have some, some cycles that do cause these anomalies mm -hmm. that Asset tries to address, but uh, um, yeah. But that's that, well. It's not in every use case. Yeah, your use case is kind of specific, so you, you can do it that way. I think everyone use cases at some point will become specific. Let me. I'm happy to, to discuss further, <laughs> but there were some other questions as well, and, and I don't know. Yeah, Fad. Um, so you mentioned the biggest database was 70 terabytes. Yeah, roughly. And you run everything on premise. Or yes. Physical infrastructure. Yes. What kind of hardware are you using now? Some IBMs and some uh, dedicated SSDs, which I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, mention the name, but no. we buy some good SSD storage cabinets and they work very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> In regard to CPUs, because everything CPUs are uh, um, some, some nodes run with uh, uh, 12 cores, others with uh, uh, 36 cores. Um, we do see CPU usage being a bottleneck sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mainly because the amount of queries we run, because I showed you the write queries, but the read queries also exist, and every read query in Postgres needs to be parsed and executed. Yeah. And the parsing can, can at some point become a very interesting spike in your CPU. So uh, CPUs, just buy a lot of them, because you'll need them at scale. OK, thanks. Yeah, question. Is it possible to somehow prepare statements so it doesn't need to parse the query? That's what we do. Uh, uh, however, <laughs> you cannot, you cannot, um, that works nicely and you, uh, that's what Postgres does with a prepared statement and you can actually say that it then should reuse that plan. Uh, but if you run a lot of connections on a lot of uh, uh, nodes, chances that you create a statement that doesn't have a prepared plan with it are also considerable, um, but for example, that point of using prepared statement does not allow us to use a very nice connection pool called PG Bouncer. PG Bouncer is a great thing of, of channeling thousands of transactions into 
only a few in your database because your database can do at most n cores at the same time. So having thousands of active connections in your database is, is not to your uh, uh, benefit. Um, but the problem with PG Bouncer is it does not support this prepared statement uh, uh, feature. So that's bummer. <coughs> Yeah. How do you use upgrade Postgres? We use PG upgrade. It takes one, two minutes. So um, yeah. Just when, for those when do, you, who, hmm? when do you upgrade? When do we upgrade? Well business hours. Uh, yes, business hours. Um, because all these tiny databases I'll try to get back to the uh, more tiny database. We can basically their status. So if this one dies, the next one can take the other next piece of information. So what we can just do if we have a controlled upgrade, which is perhaps it's always good to simulate failure, but we have controlled situations, we just cut it out so that it doesn't fail anymore, but it does empty, which basically means we could not even upgrade it, but just kick it out and install the new database. For the big one, like I said, we can have 15 to 15 minutes to an hour of downtime without any issue. The PG upgrade is quick. But then the next stage in PG Upgrade is getting some statistics of your database again. <laughs> getting statistics of 75 terabytes takes time, so therefore we probably need an hour of downtime, even though we could already open the database for some connections after a few minutes. Um, but yeah, if you have the time, take the time. We want to go to the point that we can use logical replication. Logical replication has been an interesting extension to Postgres up to 10. Now it's part of it is in core, um, and the building blocks of very rich functionality are now there. And we hope to be using that very quickly. We upgrade very quickly because normally every Postgres release has good uh, uh, features for performance on very concurrent systems. Uh, um, yeah. So if you run Postgres concurrently, you have performance issues, just at least do a latest upgrade and then. Uh, other questions? Yeah. First of all, props for running 75 terabytes in one um, machine. Um, but yeah, during the talk, you mentioned uh, both the size of the segments of one gigabyte and yeah. the vacuuming being kind of a bottleneck. So, what would the impact be of uh, increasing the size of the segments to 10 gigabytes or doing levels, uh, kind of like level E does in the camera, uh, have some of one gigabyte? gigabytes, some of 10 gigabytes, mm -hmm. especially given your biggest ledger, I think was, or your biggest table was kind of your ledger, which is mm -hmm. immutable, should be. I don't think I can answer that question. No. The only thing I can say if you talk about MongoDB and, and sizes, you're talking about storing documents, whereas in Postgres, the segment, Postgres stores things as rows, which is a, has a different dynamic. Um, um, so it probably will be part of the answer I could give if I had the ability to ask that question. Yeah. Anybody knows a question about talk? Okay. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Sorry. 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 Yes. But so what happens if your master fails? Like right? something breaks, mm -hmm. meritorite strikes the day Amsterdam. Right? It's yes. asynchronous replication, right? So. Uh, we have synchronous replicas close by, and we have pretty much synchronous replications a bit further. Synchronous replication. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we just, um, but the synchronous replication. The problem is the the um, the round trip to the other side, and that one of the reasons why I asked about phonology because this round trip for us half a millisecond is already a lot of time. So I was really thinking, how can you do that on a global scale where you're talking about hundreds of milliseconds, which is Four orders of magnitude more of what we can basically accept as as latency. Yes. So, how hard is it really, or how specialistic is it to sort of grow the database to this uh, size? Really, because you've mentioned a couple of times that it's really trusted, you know, technology that has the ability to scale. But I work at a small startup, mm -hmm. and I've we you know we. I've worked with some fairly large data sets, but nothing like this. So if you're a startup and you're planning mm -hmm. for growth, um, then you might not have the specialistic knowledge that you need to 
scale the database, whereas if you're using a NoSQL uh, solution, uh, can I just you might stop you there. This took 12 times on a very successful unicorn business. So I'm not trying to take, again, I'm not trying to say you're not going to grow there, but it is, you need a very special use case to become this big. So I would not plan for scaling for the next 12 years. We're not no, planning that either. It's also We're just <laughs> surviving the next two years. It's not what my, my question is aimed at because but my feeling is or my hunch is that you know you're gonna need to tune your system much much earlier already, right? So um, if you're a startup and you're planning for two or three years of growth <laughs> maybe, yeah. uh, then especially if you're a young team, you might already run or expect to run into the limits of at least your own knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Whereas the NoSQL vendors or the especially the managed solutions, it's really easy to just throw extra hardware at it. Um, which, so is, which is not, uh, which is uh, one of my anecdotes was that that is <coughs> not true. So I would, I would, I don't have the data here to back that up, but I would challenge that assumption. <coughs> I think you will have the same problems. If you hit scale at Mongo, MongoDB called 150 gigabytes scale, you will have an issue. You need to manage that. So that's the, the problem of choosing a technology and thinking it is free, I think is not something you can get away with. Choosing a service where you pay money or pay support, that probably will get you somewhere. So if you have a cloud environment, and you say, I don't want to think about it, I just want to be able to scale up. If you choose Amazon RDS, Google <coughs> SQL, or Aurora Postgres, you basically have those options. So when it comes to Postgres, you have those options. Um, and then at this scale, it is actually financially attractive to get some specialist in and not run it in a cloud environment. Um, yeah, I don't want to know what this costs per hour. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I was wondering about Agent. Do we also have some things running in the clouds? We basically don't do cloud. Okay. Um, I think that's more of a business. We're doing things with money. It's it's going to open up a big can of worms if you want to do cloud. So if you don't need cloud for some other reasons, then uh, then it's good. But it does mean we have an infrastructure team. It does mean we have to run. Yeah, but and we have to we have to do all that stuff. Yeah, so that's that's the boring old stuff I know. All right.